Good afternoon. This is Derek Olson, the president of World Oregon. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled American Retreat Foreign Policy Under, Mel, Under Trump with our presenter, Mel Gertoff, uh, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Portland State University. Uh, Mel is a frequent presenter for us and Portland State University, a longtime partner of ours, and we're delighted to be partnering on this event. Um, because of the nature of the topic, just want to remind everyone that World Oregon is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. We host um, authors and experts in a range of viewpoints um, for a lively intellectual discussion and debate. Uh, Mr. Gertoff will be uh, presenting today. Uh, then Director of Programs Tim DeRoche will come on a little bit later and moderate questions from the audience. If you have not participated in one of our webinars before, I encourage you to get your questions ready. You can post them in the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, also keep an eye out on chat where we'll be posting information about uh, Mel's blog. And we plan to send follow-up information to those registered on how to purchase the book at discounted price. Book is hot off the presses and, and Mel will be able to uh, talk about the book as well as add, answer other questions uh, regarding foreign policy under the Trump administration. A few words again uh, about our Zoom webinars. Uh, all of participants audio and video is off or muted except for World Oregon and, and our presenter. So again, please use the Q&A function to pose your questions. We thank you for being a World Oregon member. These events are currently free for World Oregon members and your membership dollars help us um, be able to maintain our work in this challenging time. At the end of the program, we'll talk about our future upcoming events. Uh, now a few um, short words of bio of our uh, impressive speaker. As I mentioned, uh, Mel Gertoff is a professor emeritus of political science at Portland State University. In addition to this book, his most recent books are Engaging Adversaries, Peacemaking, and Diplomacy in the Human Interest in 2018. And again, this one, American Retreat, Foreign Policy under Donald Trump, just coming uh, just out in 2020. He blogs at melgertoff.com. Again, we'll post that link in the chat. It's an honor to have him present for us. Without further ado, Professor Mel Gertoff. Thank you very much, uh, Derek, and thank you, Tim, as well. Um, it's always a pleasure to be virtually in, in Portland, although um, I'd much prefer to be uh, person to person with you uh, rather than where I am, which is in uh, Deadwood. Um, Deadwood is a small community in uh, Western Lane County. and um, we, uh, we were under tremendous haze and smoke, just like you folks, uh, for a good while. And that's why we had to uh, rearrange the timing for, uh, for this presentation. Um, friends, when I first uh, got seriously into research for this book, uh, wondered why I would bother uh, writing on Donald Trump's foreign policy because um, they said, uh, laughingly, uh, is there really one? Uh, I think uh, in, a, in one sense, uh, no, there isn't a, uh, and hasn't been a foreign policy in the strict sense of, of the term policy, uh, which usually includes strategic planning and so forth. Uh, but certainly under Trump and largely with the impact of Trump's own thinking, there is a general direction that the United States has been taking very different from that of uh, Republican or Democratic administrations. And um, although one would like to think, or at least I would, that, uh, that this is a passing phase in uh, foreign policy and that if there's a change in administrations, uh, there'll be a, a, a dramatic overhaul. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, the latest polls indicate that at least on the Republican side, uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, notions of the direction for U.S. foreign policy have really uh, taken hold. Uh, and I'm referring to a Chicago Council of World Affairs uh, poll that was uh, recently conducted among uh, Democrats and Republicans, which found that on one hand, both groups overwhelmingly by about two to one want the United States to, be, to remain internationally engaged but with a tremendous diversion as to engagement on what terms. And among Republicans, they have 
really bought into the notion of making America great, which is to say, uh, going it alone in, in world affairs. That's not the same as isolationism, uh, but really it, it is coincident with a, a notion of American nationalism, which is uh, something that uh, Donald Trump has ex explicitly uh, subscribed to, uh, and the view that uh, the United States is, should be in the world for itself. Uh, a prominent uh, commentator recently uh, wrote that for Trump, uh, foreign policy is mostly an expensive uh, distraction, an expensive distraction. And I think that does, in a few words at least, uh, capture what, what it is about Trump's uh, view of the world that makes it so different from any past administration. When he first began commenting uh, seriously on foreign affairs, uh, Donald Trump was limited his view to two, two issues. Uh, one, stopping immigration, and secondly, winning, a very important Trump word, winning on trade. Just those two. And it's really uh, extraordinary to see the way those two issues have morphed into a more general uh, impact on world affairs that has really, uh, in some ways, staggered the imagination of uh, commentators, political scientists, and the general public uh, alike. And as I think about the ways in which uh, that those two issues have impacted uh, a more uh, international affairs and, and the, the role of the United States in the world, it really comes down to quite a, a quite a long list, and that's what I would primarily like like to focus on. Uh, and at the end, um, whether in my presentation or uh, in the Q&A section, um, I'd also like to entertain uh, thoughts about what a Biden administration would do that might be different from uh, what the Trump people uh, have been doing. But as to the impact of those two, um, of the, those two issues, immigration and trade, first of all, uh, it has meant uh, from the very beginning, an effort to wipe out the Obama legacy on, uh, on important issues ranging from environmental protection to the Iran nuclear deal and much else uh, besides. Uh, the very first thing that Trump's people did when they, after the election, was to uh, send teams to the various foreign policy related uh, bureaucracies with the notion of getting rid of, uh, of Obama's loyalists uh, and replacing them with Trump loyalists, but with really very little regard, uh, according to many reports, uh, to the issues and to training in, in where the United States was on these issues. Uh, and that's because uh, Trump uh, despises bureaucracy and has really had no interest in, in strategic planning. Uh, and his team consequently uh, followed, followed suit. They simply took over uh, offices. But as we're well aware, uh, Trump uh, has, has picked up on Steve Bannon's notion of, uh, of the deep state and therefore a, a conspiratorial view of, uh, of people who are in charge of bureaucratic agencies and a perfect willingness to purge those agencies of people who most importantly uh, are not loyal enough. It's really not been a matter of being expert, in fact, expertise itself uh, is looked down upon, as I think we're all aware, uh, with COVID-19 and the scientific uh, community. But really that applies off the board, uh, across the board. Uh, bureaucracies in general and bureaucratic leaders, uh, granted, have always been somewhat a, a suspect in, in the minds of presidents, but to a degree uh, in the Trump administration that we've never seen before. Uh, secondly, there's the matter of uh, Trump's uh, nationalism. Um, Steve uh, Bannon, I think, uh, had a, a very a good insight into it. And I just wanted to read one, one small quote, uh, which says, America first. It's not America as isolationist. It's not America alone. It's never been that. Trump's never said that. It's America's engagement in the world as never before, but it is partnership that is also on America's terms, not just as part of these faceless international organizations, 
these globalist institutions run by people in Davos and people in Brussels and people in Geneva. And I think that's, that's true. You know, uh, uh, there are uh, any number of commentators who have seen Trump as, a, as an, an isolationist, but that's uh, not really the case. It's rather a matter of, of completely changing the terms of America's involvement in the world exclusively to America's benefit. And it's in that sense that uh, Trump therefore has very little regard for international institutions, for multilateral engagement, for coalition building, uh, all of these things uh, simply, and, and one very important, we must add, alliances, all of which are regarded as rather costly diversions uh, that really don't benefit America very much. Uh, and thus we've seen America depart from any number of these uh, international agreements and, and organizations, um, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, Paris uh, Climate Change Accord. If Trump fully had his way, the US uh, relationship with treaty uh, partners like South Korea and Japan would very fundamentally change with, with, the, with the NATO as well. And it's only been because on occasion, the internationalists uh, have been successful at least for a while. I'm not sure what that would mean in a second Trump administration, but for a while in his first term at persuading Trump that the costs of uh, withdrawal exceed the costs of, uh, of, of uh, staying in. So it's worked sometimes. But what you have found, what I have found uh, looking at nationalists versus internationalists when in terms of the, the people around Trump is that over time, uh, the nationalists were consistently able to, to win the day on uh, the most important issues. And the internationalists, uh, including th those who were previously uh, military leaders, um, or people like Rex Tillerson in the corporate world, or people heading the intelligence community, all of those people have been removed. And so the internationalist influence has uh, by now dramatically uh, weakened. And the nationalist wing, with maybe an exception or two like John Bolton, uh, who was fired for other reasons, uh, has been in the ascendancy. And that is, represents a very important trend which can only continue if there is a second uh, Trump administration. Uh, thirdly, as I said, global institutions have, have really suffered in terms of American involvement. And that's one of the main reasons for speaking about America in retreat. Uh, Donald Trump has taken aim at what he calls globalism uh, in his ranks. And he has weeded out those people who, who seem to subscribe to the idea that the United States really does gain, which of course it has gained from being actively involved in, in international institutions starting with the World Trade Organization and the United Nations and moving uh, right along to regional organizations. Um, third, the relationship with allies uh, has, has significantly changed. Uh, in the name of trade, we have seen Trump uh, take issue with Canada, Mexico, and, and uh, various European partners, as well as South Korea and Japan. Uh, those relationships have never been as important to, to uh, Trump as has the bottom line uh, and winning, as he constantly says, winning on trade. Trump has had no interest uh, in global community ideas, such as uh, human rights, the internet, the will of the international community, um, the moral authority of the United States, and any of those things which he, which he tends to subsume under the title of globalism. Uh, for Trump, these are, again, uh, distractions. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, making uh, America great again, he does not see any of those things, uh, what we often call in, in political science, at least American idealism, uh, as being at all important to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the American uh, agenda. Uh, and for that reason, um, uh, he has been perfectly comfortable embracing dictators. Uh, you may have noticed uh, that in Bob Woodward's uh, latest book, uh, he has a section in which Trump uh, 
wonders aloud to himself why he's been so successful with, uh, with dictators and less so with uh, the leaders of allied nations. And that's certainly true. Uh, he is roundly disliked and even despised within the NATO community, for example. But um, he seems to think that he just gets along fine with uh, Xi Jinping and, of course, uh, Vladimir Putin and Kim, and Kim Jong-un uh, and Erdogan in, in, uh, in Turkey and so on down the list. Well, I think uh, the answer that uh, Woodward might have given to Trump's uh, question, because it was a question, why, why am I, do I get along so well, is that I think Trump uh, views himself uh, as someone who uh, is a stable genius and, and could run the, um, run the United States most effectively if he followed in the footsteps of people like Putin. I think he is actually quite envious of Putin and what people like Putin uh, as autocrats have been able to accomplish without having to be bothered by bureaucratic or other kinds of political uh, interference. So the fewer the opponents, the, the more the loyalism, uh, the greater opportunity for Trump to, uh, to really do, to carry out his America first uh, agenda. Um, Trump said those same Trump issues of uh, immigration and, and winning on trade also uh, I think have, have uh, much to do with America's uh, involvement in the world in other ways. For example, foreign aid and relations with developing countries. Uh, I won't repeat that, that particular phrase that Trump used to categorize uh, Haiti and other, uh, other poor countries, but he has no interest in, in international development. And it has a lot to do with the, the way the United States has ceded leadership on foreign aid to China and its Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and primarily in Africa, but we're seeing this also taking place uh, throughout Latin America. Uh, the United States uh, can no longer be looked to as a provider of important development assistance. Uh, and when it comes to cooperation on important development related matters, such as uh, public health, well, I think COVID-19 has provided the answer there. The United States has cut itself out of the World Health Organization um, in the case of China in particular, it removed uh, scientists, uh, doctors who were involved in a very productive way with China on uh, public health cooperation. Uh, these kinds of things are just of no interest to him because Trump uh, thinks it's, it's just a, a, another costly diversion. Um, and uh, he sees no, he does not see that the politics of the issue and how it impacts America's standing and prestige in the world. But then again, standing and prestige in the world are, not, again, not of interest to him unless there is an actual payoff. And this leads finally to, to probably the, the most significant aspect of Trump is, Trump's foreign policy that is most worrisome. And that is that diplomacy in general uh, has dramatically declined in the Trump era. We have seen time and again how people in the State Department have either resigned or, or been removed. Uh, the, the notion that uh, diplomacy is, is a successful way to, um, to conduct foreign affairs and gain international respect and um, be able to win uh, without having to confront, that kind of thing uh, is, is just uh, not part of Trump's thinking. And here I have to uh, bring in Trump's character uh, to a degree that I, th I don't think uh, is the case with any uh, president in recent memory. Trump's character, the president's character, uh, has everything to do with shaping the American approach to the world. Uh, usually uh, personality issues of a president uh, are not something that political scientists care to touch upon. But in this case, it's pretty obvious. And it, and it stems mostly from Trump's business experience and how he has treated uh, adversaries in the, in the business world. I won't uh, belabor the point because I think that uh, uh, such characteristics as uh, bullying, lying, um, and 
in general, uh, just trying to, to take advantage of, of the opponent are things that are much more important to, to Trump than the notion of win-win, for example. And so uh, we find time and again that Trump's preferred uh, arsenal for dealing with problematic relationships uh, consists of threats, sanctions, uh, and uh, that that uh, that kind of uh, that kind of behavior, and um, and we have learned, or at least we should have learned, that that kind of behavior uh, doesn't go over too well, particularly with with strong-minded adversaries like China. Uh, if anything, uh, the Chinese have reacted uh, just as, I, at least I, as a China specialist, would have predicted, uh, which is that they they have shown you know, given their own nationalism and their own historical background that they can give as well as take. And so we are in a, uh, as I discussed in my last World Affairs Council uh, presentation, we are in a deep trough in relations with, with China such as we have not seen since the early years of, uh, of Cold War. So personality, uh, character uh, really do uh, play a part. Uh, Trump, considers himself, uh, as, as I've said, and as you're well aware, as a, uh, a genius who does not need assistance in any sphere of public activity, whether it be on the diplomatic front or the military one. And this uh, presents a very troublesome situation for the foreign policy of the United States. Um, again, it's not, it's not uh, proper to call it isolationist, uh, because Trump does hope to shape the world uh, in the belief that the world needs the United States more than the United States needs the world. Uh, this, um, this notion is, a, is not only um, a, a selfish one, uh, but really one that I think has brought down America's standing in the world to pretty much rock bottom. Let me um, just uh, by way of conclusion, say uh, a, a few things about what <clears throat> what uh, another uh, an, an alternative view might might be. And in the in the concluding chapter of my book, I do talk uh, about what a Biden uh, presidency uh, might mean. It would not be a wholesale uh, change by any means in uh, in U.S. foreign policy. I do think, for example, that U.S. relations with, with Israel and in general in the Middle East are not likely to change all that uh, dramatically, except perhaps in Yemen and a withdrawal of support, which is contrary to international law and uh, could well bring certain, uh, certain U.S. officials uh, before the bar of justice at some point uh, in, in support of Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, war with, against, uh, against Yemen. But uh, in general, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's, there would be any dramatic change. Uh, the most important thing that, that could change is uh, that Biden would probably seek to restore one of the most significant legacies of, of uh, President Obama and a very, and to my mind, a very positive one, namely the nuclear deal uh, with Iran. Um, I do think, however, that on at least a couple of fronts, uh, Biden would seek to significantly change uh, the U.S. direction. One of them would be on international environmental policy, the other on, uh, on human rights. Um, the relationship with, uh, with China, I think uh, it's, there's, a, there's a real issue here as to whether, uh, whether Biden may feel trapped by the, the strong rhetoric and the, and, and the actual policy changes that have been made uh, by Trump with relation to China. And so uh, that I have not, I've yet to hear any significant uh, suggestion from, from the Biden people that things are going to be very different with China, which is extremely, to my mind, unfortunate. Likewise with Russia, uh, the, I think uh, here is where uh, Trump is, uh, has, has set a, a tone uh, and Biden um, although he's not going to fawn over, over uh, Vladimir Putin, um, I think he's going to continue to have a, a, the kind of policy that the, at least Republicans in Congress have, have uh, joined with Democrats in pursuing, 
which is to be fairly strong on the sanctions end. And so that promises to be a, a, another relationship with a great power that uh, is not going to, uh, to lead to any, any significant change uh, very soon. Uh, nevertheless, I have to say that in the interest of transparency, I, I'm, uh, I'm certainly uh, very much in favor of a, of a Biden uh, presidency because I think that uh, Don, under Donald Trump, the United States has, uh, has taken a, an extraordinarily selfish and misdirected and, and re really valueless approach to international affairs, which has primarily gotten us into trouble. Uh, has supported dictators and has failed to promote the best in America, namely uh, democracy and a respect for human rights. So I'll stop there um, because I know there are going to be questions and I'll ask Tim to, uh, to take over. Well, thanks, Mel. This is uh, Tim DeRoche, the disembodied voice of World Oregon's director of programs. Um, I'm going to start right in on some questions. We've got a question from well, this is great. We have questions from two different Spencers. Um, the first, Spencer A, uh, from Trump's point of view, if post-World War II internationalism represents the old order, what, if anything, is the direction of his new order? And does his new order have long-term goals or quarterly goals like in business? One of the things about uh about the Trump administration is, and it goes along with what I've been saying about uh, a disregard for bureaucracy, is that strategic planning uh, is, seems to be a very limited enterprise. Any, every uh, administration before this one uh, made a big deal about strategic planning, and it was important for students of foreign policy like myself to study the bureaucratic environment and see how bureaucracies were organized to feed information to the president. <clears throat> and there are various models that, uh, that are often uh, put forward to show that uh, how, how planning takes place and which bureaucracies uh, are, are most influential in feeding information and points of view to a president. But in this case, you have a president who, um, with, with an extraordinary ego, with a deep suspicion and even a conspiratorial view of bureaucracies. And so when you ask uh, what, what is the long-term view of the United States, is there anything that would replace what's usually referred to as liberal internationalism? Uh, it's, really, it's really hard to say. I think uh, that, that it's a very narrow-minded approach in which, in which the United States, well, as we see before us, is, is disengaged from uh, all major international organizations, and even where it isn't still involved, like the UN or the World Trade Organizations, it's pretty much on the periphery, and it, it's not seeking to uh, to take any kind of leadership role. In fact, it is ceding ceding that leadership role to China, which has gladly taken it. Uh, so there is no, uh, as I have, as far as I can tell, any any model that would replace liberal internationalism. Uh, America in retreat is not a model for, uh, for leadership. Um, and it does have, I mean, I would also like to say that, that there is one aspect of this which, um, which is notable and to my mind uh, has a positive aspect to it. And that is that Trump has not embraced the notion of American exceptionalism which has been a common notion among Republican and Democratic administrations alike. That notion of exceptionalism has driven the United States into places and in, in, in involvements and interventions where it should not have gone. And so in that sense, uh, it's, it's, um, it's uh, to the credit, I suppose, of the Trump administration that it has not embraced that idea. But neither has it replaced it with some more positive view of the United States role in, in the world. So we have Spencer B here. He says, assuming Biden becomes president, how long will it take for America's outward looking institutions like the State Department to recover and repopulate their infrastructure and reestablish their preeminence in international relations? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, of course, we don't really know how long it would take. Uh, some 
some uh, commentators uh, have suggested that uh, Trump has created a whole new world um, and that institutions like the State Department uh, are now cowering and uh, are never going to, to achieve their, their former uh, place in the, in the bureaucratic order. Um, so others argue that, uh, that Trump, um, the Trump era is, is not uh, reversible in any sense at all, or, or only partly so. I happen to think that uh, more positively that, uh, that the State Department and other agencies, including especially the intelligence community, let's not forget, which has also been very much under the gun, uh, can restore their authority, uh, can be treated with respect, um, and, uh, and can attract people, once again, uh, people who are uh, expert in their fields. Um, you know, and, and I imagine that some of the same people who have resigned in protest or in dis disgust from these agencies will return in a Biden, a Biden era. You know, the, the Washington story in, when it comes to bureaucracy is often a story of a, a revolving door. And so the revolving door will bring back a lot of liberals from, uh, from past administrations, um, associates of Obama's and, and of course, Hillary Clinton's and Bill Clinton's and so on. Uh, that's not necessarily a great thing, um, especially if you're looking for, as I would personally hope, uh, for a breakthrough in uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, the Middle East and especially U.S.-Israel uh, relations. Uh, but nevertheless, that's most likely what's going to happen. So I don't think we should despair that, um, that the system is so broken uh, and dismembered that, uh, that there can't be a period of recovery. So we've got a number of uh, trade questions that are popping up. Uh, here's one for you. Trump's failed trade and foreign policy still needs China for the ag deal, energy exports, and as a critical market for U.S. tech, particularly chip exports, how would you see these imperatives playing out under either a Trump or a Biden administration? Well, uh, for one thing, there will be serious negotiations and not uh, the kind of approach that uh, where Trump tries to hammer the Chinese into uh, accepting a, a particular trade deal. As we've already seen, um, he, the, the phase one trade deal with China is, is, is no longer really a, a, in, in process. Uh, the COVID, his, his uh, determination to link China to uh, COVID-19, which uh, is again on display at the United Nations uh, today, uh, that has really destroyed what, what little was left of, uh, of a $250 billion Chinese, supposed Chinese commitment to increasing uh, imports of US goods. Uh, starting with, with agricultural goods. Um, so uh, I think the main, the main thing that, uh, that Biden will bring to the table uh, is that there will be a more uh, serious and respectful uh, trade negotiation, that he will not use uh, trade or, or, or as, a, as a weapon to beat over the Chinese head and presume that the Chinese are going to give in because China's economy needs, needs a, a trade deal with the United States more than the reverse, um, which I think is, has, is, where, uh, is where Trump has proven to be uh, so, so totally incorrect. Uh, I think also you won't have people in charge of, of, of trade like say uh, uh, Navar Peter Navarro, who is an absolute crazy when it comes to dealing with China you know, the author of a couple of books, very conspiratorial books uh, with strong elements of Cold War thinking uh, on, on China. So I think there'll be people, there'll be experts uh, on hand who will be able to, to treat trade in the calm, deliberate, and yes, also frustrating way that trade uh, deals have to be uh, conducted. Um, and there'll be much more of, I think, an arrangement for uh, for mutual, um, uh, what shall we say, checking of, of, of each other to see that trade, that trade issues, uh, agreements really are followed through, uh, rather than just making um, absurd promises uh, in, in large numbers that are politically motivated and not really 
determined by actual stuff on the ground. Uh, Biden, you know, has has strong um, uh, Wall Street and and other uh, longstanding connections. Uh, you can be sure that uh, this, some of the same uh, factors that are that are at work in terms of influencing trade policy from the corporate world, um, and in particular sectors of agriculture, steel, autos, and that kind of thing, uh, that they will once again be at work. But it'll be a more predictable process. Maybe that's really the key way to put it, a more predictable process um, with sanctions uh, not being resorted to as a matter of course. Great. So we at World Oregon, we have a program coming up October 15th with the Pacific Northwest International Trade Association looking at trade in the elections. And um, so pulling back, you sort of touched on that. Are there some other um, nuances to how either candidate might handle trade policy? I mean, we, we, you were talking about China, but we've got the EU to think about. We've got a number of different um, uh, areas that are sort of uh, in, a, in an up for grab state. So curious of your thoughts there. Well, the other, the other major trade uh, agreement that has been um, now uh, taken care of is the uh, sort of NAFTA point two, US Mexico Canada agreement. Uh, and fortunately, that's an area where uh, the administration was so desperate for an agreement and so concerned about uh, how Nancy Pelosi would shelve it that uh, that it really gave in quite a bit on democratic uh, demands. Uh, now that hasn't uh, resolved a number of very important issues uh, still with uh, with Canada on, for example, steel and with, with Mexico um, on, on a number of other fronts. Um, but at least uh, that was one the one trade agreement that was that that did go through. But the point I made earlier, and which needs reiterating, is that on the whole, if one looks uh, globally at the situation, uh, the Chinese have really grasped uh, the mantle of leadership on economic globalization, and it's done so through that very ambitious. Uh, and not entirely successful Belt and Road Initiative that in very round terms involves about a trillion dollars of investment and in, uh, to promote uh, Chinese uh, trade and other interests. Uh, but it really has captured markets in uh, Africa and Latin America and even some in Europe that the United States has just chosen uh, not to pay attention to. Uh, and then when you have in addition the US withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership that uh, was a signature of, uh, of Obama's, uh, again, um, trade leadership has fallen uh, to the Chinese and they have been uh, exceptionally good at, at using it uh, for both uh, economic and political advantage. So um, aside from uh, NAFTA point two, uh, the United States has really very little to show in, in terms of, uh, of trade uh, leadership. Uh, and if you extended that to the issue of, uh, of foreign uh, investment and, uh, and the role of, of um, American corporations in uh, so-called you know, greenfield uh, investments, that is to say uh, investments uh, to, to create uh, subsidiaries at home, to, uh, abroad in order to, to, to send exports back to the United States, but there again, um, corporations have defied Trump. And uh, they're not about to come home to America in the, in the way that Trump um, has said. And so um, notwithstanding uh, the, the kinds of um, claims of, of manufacturing jobs and other jobs saved uh, by the Trump administration, the reality is that the United States has lost millions of jobs uh, uh, abroad and corporations uh, are doing what they know how to do best preserving their own, their own particular interests and not paying much regard to the notion of uh, making America great uh, by pulling, in their, pulling up their stakes abroad and coming back home. Uh, that has really happened in relatively few cases. So on the subject of uh, the TPP, could and should the US, this is actually a two-part question and it's really about, you know, kind of larger multilateral issues, but could and should the US under a Biden administration rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
And the second part of the question is granted that a Biden administration would seek to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal. Do you anticipate that Iran would now be willing to do so? And how would Biden perhaps respond to Israeli and Saudi opposition to such a move? Right. Um, well, first of all, as to the, uh, the TPP, I think, I think uh, Biden has already indicated that he would rejoin the TPP. And then his problem will be to sell it as, uh, as Obama tried to, uh, to especially environmental uh, interests. Um, because uh, it's the usual question that's, that came up with NAFTA and comes up with every, every trade agreement. And that is to what extent uh, is there, are there uh, environmental protection concerns that are part of the agreement? Uh, issues of worker health and safety also come into play. Uh, and those will, will then be a matter of intra-democratic um, dialogue and where that will end up is hard to say, but Biden will certainly rejoin TPP. Uh, the, the Iran thing is, uh, is very uh, interesting. I do believe that uh, uh, Biden is already committed to seeking to um, restore uh, that agreement. Uh, it may have to be at this point uh, renegotiated, but uh, I think uh, America's allies, certainly in, in Europe, although that's not to speak of what the Chinese and the Russians might have to say, but those allies uh, would certainly welcome uh, the United States uh, back into it. Uh, it would have to involve the United States dropping the variety of sanctions that have been imposed, including a, new, a whole new set just yesterday by the Trump administration, sanctions on Iran. Uh, there would have to be a, a, a change in American rhetoric on, on Iran, which has been essentially in the direction of promoting regime change, which has, of course, backfired. Uh, it has only strengthened the hardliners around, um, around the Ayatollah. Uh, and so there'll be a, there's need to, for the United States to dramatically change not just the terms of an agreement, uh, but also to change the, the rhetoric and, and direction of what United States expects from Iran. But I do believe uh, that even the hardliners like, like the Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, who have now, uh, in, in the wake of uh, Trump's reaction, have trashed the agreement and have put, put uh, the foreign policy folks who negotiated out on a limb. I do believe that in, in their heart of hearts, they would like to have uh, a restoration of an agreement uh, that would enable them to, to function, to their economy, which is in very bad shape, to function again in a sanction-less world, uh, and one in which the United States would resume its obligation under that uh, nuclear agreement to normalize trade relations uh, along with the Europeans. And, you know, it's, I, I wrote in my book on engagement, engaging adversaries, and I repeated in this new book, um, that Contrary to what analysts say, always talking about, well, you know, even with the nuclear agreement, Iran can still uh, resume a nuclear program and proceed toward bomb, bomb making after 15 years. But what's not, what's constantly being missed is the opportunity uh, to use the nuclear agreement as a start off point for a more serious engagement with Iran that could dramatically alter the geopolitical map of the Middle East, you know? Uh, it's, it's, it, the nuclear agreement need not be the end all of relations with Iran. It should really be a, a starting point um, and it, for, for no, a more normal relationship. And in that, we can then dampen down the enthusiasm of the Israelis and the Saudis, who of course, under Trump have been fed uh, the, uh, the hardline view that the only way to pacify the Middle East is to get rid of, of the uh, Khomeini regime uh, and, and all the people like it, who are part of it in, uh, in Iran. Uh, that, that sort of thing can only lead to constant friction, constant confrontation and war. You know, uh, if the United States continues down the path with Iran that it, that it has now, uh, which has included using assassination uh, as part of foreign policy. Uh, then in a second Trump administration, contrary to what we could expect under Biden, uh, we would face 
a, a series of confrontations with Iran that could, whether by design or miscalculation, lead to war. And, and, listen, and as long as Trump is willing to curry favor with, uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, the, uh, with Ben Salman in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and with Netanyahu and the right wing in Israel, uh, it's go we're going to be proceeding down a, a very dangerous path. So it is worth noting, Mel, that um, that question came from Mark Katz from George Mason University, who is a former student of yours at UC Riverside from the 70s. Yes, and Mark, Mark is a, uh, in his own right, is a very distinguished uh, Russia scholar. And uh, we, we do keep in touch. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Great. Um, since you went down this road, I'm wondering if uh, you could, um, if you could give us your assessment of the recent uh, Middle East peace deals and what the implications are. Yes, uh, I wrote a blog on this um, a, a few, about a week or, or so ago. Um, from an Israeli uh, uh, right wing uh, a point of view, this was a great achievement and it's certainly being paraded as such by the Trump administration uh, to the point where Donald Trump, uh, of course, with uh, with his ego, actually thinks that uh, he could win a Nobel Peace Prize for it. Uh, I don't think the uh, anyone in the Palestinian camp or anyone concerned about human rights in, in the Middle East would want to give uh, Trump a second thought about about a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, because uh, on one hand, you know, it, it's that agreement signaled the failure of uh, Jared Kushner's long-running so-called peace plan, which was entirely one-sided uh, and which the Palestinians refused to, to buy into. Um, and on the other hand, um, has once again resulted in, uh, in sidelining uh, the Palestinians on behalf of a promise which uh, has, no, has no meaning other than, than a promise that uh, that Netanyahu or his or a successor uh, will not annex the remainder of the of the West Bank, uh, and so um, on that promise, um, this deal was worked out. It was very clever to uh, be able to put it uh, quite that way and present it as a victory. But you know, I I write from a global citizen point of view, as some of the as some of you folks know, and human rights, uh, all human rights are very important to me. And although I certainly believe in, in the importance of this Israel's security, uh, that security can't come at the expense and need not come at the expense of other people who have a legitimate stake in, uh, in territory uh, for historical and contemporary reasons. Uh, and I believe that this was a disservice uh, of the first order to the, to the Palestinian people uh, and it's only going to lead to trouble down the road. Uh, and uh, uh, I can imagine that Palestinian leaders are extremely angry with uh, uh, leaders in the Arab world, starting with those in, in, um, in the UAE and in Saudi Arabia, uh, who have abandoned them for now because it's in their self-interest and because they, they are very concerned about a united front with Trump on Iran. But uh, they may have to think again in a in a new Biden, if, uh, in a new uh, American administration. And in the meantime, my hope is, uh, although I haven't seen any evidence that this could come about, my hope is that in the name of of human rights and and justice in the Middle East, that a Biden administration will, uh, as the Obama administration was in its last year in office, willing to take another look at U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia. Uh, willing to take another look at legitimate Palestinian claims to their own human and, uh, and territorial security. So we've got, I think, one last question here, and then I'm going to turn things back over to Derek to um, uh, take us back into our day. But um, this is an interesting one. Do you see a common theme in the actions the Trump administration has taken in supporting Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, overthrowing the Maduro regime in Venezuela, negotiating peace deals with the UAE and Bahrain and dealing with the Taliban in Afghanistan? Well, I guess the common thread is um, it saves, it does save money. 
or at least so so the in the short term uh, that you could argue that this is this is uh, these are reflective of uh, Trump's uh, transnationalism, transactionalism. I'm sorry, transactionalism, um, letting uh, continuing to uh, to let the Saudis uh, uh, carry out a, a a terrible bombing campaign with American weapons uh, in in uh, Yemen. Uh, that is a clear violation of of international law and and war and and an example of, uh, of war crimes. Uh, interfering in Venezuela, but on the cheap, uh, unwilling to quite go the whole yard in support of Guaido in, um, uh, as an alternative leader uh, in, in uh, Venezuela. Um, and what were the other uh, examples of, of, of in, here in the Middle East? Um, again, uh, letting, letting the Saudis and, and the UAE uh, run, run the show with the Americans just behind the scenes. Uh, Trump is... Uh, what, what I guess ties those things all together is that uh, Trump sees uh, advantages to uh, and money, saving money included, to having others um, take the primary role uh, and, and bear the brunt of uh, responsibility. He's not one to undertake great international responsibilities any more than he is domestically. You know, I remember what he said so famously now about. Uh, about the COVID-19, I don't take responsibility. Well, uh, internationally, that's the case as well. Uh, how to how to win without uh, investing investing much uh, seems to be a very common uh, thread. And um, well, we've seen uh, the results, which are not terribly uh, remarkable. Look, uh, I'll, I'll I'll raise another example, which we haven't had a chance to talk about. North Korea, um, following on. Many exchanges of threats, uh, two different uh, high-profile sessions with the with the with Kim Jong Un. Uh, to what to what end, really, other than photo ops? Uh, the the refusal to invest in serious diplomacy as a follow-up to summit to a summit meeting or two is what has kept things uh, boiling with with North Korea. And very little, if anything, has been gained. I mean, I thought it was fine that that Trump wanted to uh, to meet with the North Korean leader, but in essence, uh, the United States has tried to get away with uh, uh, with 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 photo ops, uh, and it has, and far from preventing North Korea from uh, investing further in nuclear weapons or the means of delivering them, uh, it has only accelerated their timetable. And again, it's because uh, real negotiations led by people who are familiar with how the North Koreans operate and what are important to uh, security needs for, for the North Koreans uh, has put the United States uh, behind the eight ball uh, with the North. Whether Biden will make that investment uh, on top of all the other things that will be on his agenda, uh, of course, remains to be seen. Thanks, Mel. As always, it's great having you with us. And the conversation is always rich and rewarding. And your perspective is very, very appreciated. Handing it back over to Derek and um, wishing everyone well. Thank you. Thanks again, Mel. And thanks for the great questions, audience. And Tim, your uh, excellent job of moderating as usual. Uh, just a couple words about our upcoming programs. Uh, Thursday, another new book um, by uh, frequent presenter Peter Laufer from the University of Oregon with a radical proposal for changes in the approach to um, border and immigration with Mexico. Uh, then we have the aforementioned uh, international trade uh, policy program jointly with the Pacific Northwest International Trade Association coming up on October 15th. And I would also note, um, as uh, World Oregon members, you can uh, register for uh, events from our partner and sister organizations throughout the network. We highlight some of these in our newsletters, and most notably, the World Affairs Councils of America is having conversations with the C-suite with business leaders uh, September 28th to October 2nd, a series of very interesting webinars coming up, hosted by our partners in DC with business leaders from around the country. Uh, you can get information on all these events at our website, worldoregon.org, uh, also at the uh, World Affairs Councils of America website, which is uh, worldaffairscouncils.org. Uh, and also, if you're not already on it, sign up for our email list and you'll get all that information. Again, thank you so much for supporting our organization. Mel, thank you for the fantastic presentation. 
Pleasure. And um, we're glad that you're doing better now. We apologize for having to reschedule because of the fires and the multiple days of power outages that Mel had to suffer through. We're glad that you and the state are doing better after this tragic uh, fires and, and smoke. So thank you, Mel, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you.